Good afternoon. A couple of months ago we promised that we would be doing some videos on laboratory techniques and today what I'd like to do is cover the process of distillation. It's obviously very important industrially. It's how gasoline is made and water is purified and it's also useful to understand some of the techniques and the principles behind distillation in a lab. But rather than do some sort of dry uh, example or demonstration with beakers and flasks, what we're going to do today is we're going to make something worth distilling. We're going to make brandy. And in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to ferment a beverage. And then what we're going to be doing is distilling that a little bit later after the fermentation is complete. A few years ago, I saw an interesting video that was produced by Vice. It's uh, somewhat disturbing, but very interesting. And we'll put a link to it at the uh, bottom of this uh, video. Nevertheless, back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, there was a real long series of civil wars that were going on in Uganda and because of budgetary reasons and in order to give the soldiers that additional Dutch courage uh, there was a lot of um, alcohol production, indigenous alcohol production and the most readily available starch for the purpose was bananas. Recently a lot of private individuals have gotten into the uh, act of producing a, uh, a banana beverage and what we're going to do today is show you how that's done. If you go into a liquor store and you look for banana brandy you're probably going to find what's a mixture of grain alcohol and some corn syrup and banana extract and it's pretty nasty. If you do this the right way though the end result is actually very tasty and pretty subtle but to do that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go through the process of fermenting the bananas. When you're making a distilled spirit from grains, you're making a whiskey. And when you're making a distilled spirit from a fruit, you're making a brandy. And in the process of making a whiskey, the first step is to make a beer. It's not the kind of beer you'd go into a pub and drink. It doesn't have hops, but that's the first step in the distillation process. When you're making a brandy, the first step is to make a wine. So today what we're going to do is we're going to make banana wine. Now, one of the important things to keep in mind with bananas is that unlike uh, fermenting sugars or grape juice, uh, they've got a few extra challenges simply because the fibers, uh, fibrous nature of the fruit and the thick, heavy skins. So the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to peel and cut up the bananas. These bananas are nicely ripe, but we're going to be taking off the skins, and that's an important thing because in grains, you have to malt the grain, or essentially get it to begin sprouting in order to take the starch, which is a good way for nature to store energy, and turn it into sugar, which the seedling can eat. And that's the same thing that happens with fruit, except the enzymes that do that ripening process are in the skin. Because we're going to be removing the skin, we're going to have to do something to make up for the lack of enzymes. Okay, we'll call that 2.7 kilograms. I'm going to 
have that. making up this banana mush. Now when you're making wine, obviously you don't have to boil or heat the liquid. But because we are going to be using a, an artificial enzyme to enhance the uh, sugar conversion, that enzyme, glucoamylase, works best at an elevated temperature of between 140 degrees Fahrenheit and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're going to need to warm the mixture in order to get the enzyme to do its job. There are two forms of amylase. There's the alpha and the beta. The alpha amylase works at a slightly higher temperature and breaks down the very long chain polysaccharides to shorter chain polysaccharides and single sugars. The beta amylase works best at around 140 degrees Fahrenheit and will further the process by breaking down any of the remaining polysaccharides It looks right now like we've got 2.25 kilograms in the second batch. So if I do the addition right, that's almost exactly 5 kilograms. So now we're going to add the water. One gallon of water is a little less than 4 kilograms. So we're going to add a gallon and a half of water to this. This is not in any way a precision activity. We're just going to add enough water so that we can form a thinner mixture. Now you can do this with a blender and to help further break down the uh, fibers and get this blended up. I like using an immersion mixer simply because there's less steps, it's less messy, and there's less chance to introduce uh, bacteria and other kind of foreign particles into the uh, mixture if you're just doing this in a single operation. <laughs> And we'll do this in Fahrenheit, as I've been giving you all your temperatures in Fahrenheit, but you can obviously do the conversion pretty easily. We're going to run up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit so that we can add the alpha amylase, then we're going to let it cool a little bit more, we'll add the beta amylase, and then let it cool a little bit more, and we'll add the yeast. Okay, as you can see we've gotten to about 161, 162 degrees and we're going to allow nature to cool this off. But I want to do a little demonstration before I put in the amylase. This is the alpha amylase. It comes from BSG. A number of different companies make it. And what it does is it breaks up starch. This is some cornmeal that I added to water to make it into sort of a porridge. And because of the heavy starch content, it's obviously thick. I mean, you could make wallpaper paste out of this. I'm going to add a little bit of this amylase to this. Generally speaking, you want to add about a, a teaspoon per gallon or 15 cc's per um, 4 liters. You can do some of the conversions, but I'm just going to throw in a small quantity of this alpha amylase into here. And then I'm going to mix this, and you saw the viscosity before. You're going to see what happens now once we add the amylase. This has been heated up to about 160 degrees, and generally it'll take about an hour in a big mix to do all of the uh, conversion. But as I mix this in here, 
you'll notice that it's starting to become a little bit thinner. We're converting the starch into sugar. And sugar is much more soluble and forms a thinner liquidy mixture. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add the same amylase to our vat, which is just at about the right temperature here. So with three gallons, that means three teaspoons, that means 45 cc's, that's one tablespoon to be mixed into here. You could add more, but you don't need to. I'm going to sprinkle that around, try to get most of it in the pot. Blew a little bit into the air, but I'm just going to enhance that a little bit. And that's sufficient. And now what we're going to do, we're going to blend this in. As this cools, it'll reach the point where we can add the beta amylase around 140 degrees. And that shouldn't take that long. We've got the heat turned off, and it's relatively windy out here, so that should help carry the temperature down. Just blending that in. And... Already the temperature is now down to about 156 Fahrenheit. Put the lid on to keep the foreign matter out of here. And you can see that the mixture is noticeably thinned and it will continue to thin as the starch is converted to sugar. It would have been nice to know about this when you visited Aunt Bertha and she was making some of her wallpaper paste farina in the morning. You didn't need to sneak sugar, you just needed to have a little amylase in your pocket. Alright, so we'll wait a few more minutes. Allow this temperature to drop naturally to about 140 degrees. And then we're going to add the beta amylase. This is harder to obtain. I got this from Alpha Azar, which is a chemical company or a um, pharmaceutical chemical company uh, years ago. But you can get this, it's just a little bit less readily available. And it will help to enhance the process because you'll get a little bit more of the very simple sugars that the yeast likes to uh, eat. All right, it's been about 10 minutes and the temperature's come down to just about the right temperature for the beta amylase. Same quantity, we're gonna add 45 milliliters or three teaspoons or one tablespoon. And same idea, we're going to blend it in and let nature cool the mixture down to the temperature that the yeast will tolerate, which is below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's stir that in. Now that'll take a little longer to cool, simply because we're at a lower temperature, so it's going to cool a little more slowly. But the natural cooling process is actually what you want, because you want about a half hour of uh, duration while this cools to let the amylase do what it's going to do. And as you can see, after a few minutes with even just the alpha amylase, this has become almost watery and it's sweeter. You can taste it. It's almost as if you added sugar to it. But it's the same mixture. I haven't done anything to dilute it. Just allowed the amylase to do what it was going to do. Pretty neat, huh? All right, it's been about 25 more minutes and we've gotten the temperature down to about 100 degrees and it's safe now to add the yeast. Two things. I add a yeast nutrient uh, to these um, fermentations. Basically it's purified urea which uh, includes both phosphorus and nitrogen and it helps to add uh, some additional nutrient uh, mix to get the yeast started and get it growing very quickly because the whole idea here is we want to try to enhance the growth of the yeast so that the yeast overwhelms any other kinds of critters that might try to grow in this sweet sticky mixture like bacteria or wild yeasts. So by adding a little bit of this as well as working at the optimal temperature we can get the yeast started and sort of kick started very quickly. And finally, the last thing I like to do is I want to describe to you the yeast. You can use uh, bread yeast uh, to make any of these uh, types of distillations, but the problem with the bread yeast is it becomes intoxicated by its own alcohol output at about a 5% uh, alcohol content. 
these yeasts that are made for making fermentations uh, for alcohol uh, have a much higher survivability in alcohol. Uh, the yeast I like to use is called a champagne yeast. It's a, a sort of a category of yeast and it will survive and thrive all the way up to about a 20 percent alcohol content. It uh, there are a variety of different types of yeasts. Yeasts do uh, affect the flavor of the final beverage, but this particular yeast I've been very happy with over, over the years, and the, con the amount of yeast you add is really not that significant. Uh, you want to add enough. In general, I use the same as I use for the amylases. So once again, 45 milliliters or three teaspoons or one tablespoon. You can go through the process of uh, activating this yeast in some, in some water and sugar to kind of get it kick-started before you add it to the mix. I don't really find that that's made really any difference and it just seems to add more complexity to the process. So just put this in and then you want to stir it thoroughly. You want to get make sure that it's not clumped so each of the yeast particles get exposed to the good ingredients inside. Of and after about four days you can do a uh, specific gravity measurement, but practically speaking, you'll notice it's done when the carbon dioxide stops being produced, when the foam stops being produced. And you'll notice that uh, the bubbles that are forming the, over the next couple of days just cease uh, their production. Uh, in addition, you don't really need to use these complicated vapor locks. Carbon dioxide is heavier than air. And the reason I do this in such a large vessel is I don't bother with then transferring this over to a fermentation vessel. I just use the pot. Again, less chance of contamination and uh, less things to wash up. And this provides a decent seal when you allow for the fact that the carbon dioxide is going to form sort of a vapor seal above the yeast in this open space. Put this in some place where it's not going to be disturbed and in about three or four days. Check it every so often just to see if the bubbles have stopped. And once they have, we're going to be ready for the next stage, which is to siphon off the clear mixture, and we're going to distill it. Okay, it's been about four days, and I've taken the container out of the room where we have this fermenting. And if you look inside, you'll see that the bananas, which are very fibrous, have produced sort of an oatmeal-like film on the top surface. And that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that you have enough room for the expansion and the bubbling that occurs during the fermentation. You'll see the staining along the inner wall here shows that at one point the level had actually moved up this high. And that's one of the reasons why it's nice to add a fair amount of water and uh, to have a lot of extra headroom here so you don't make a mess. You'll also notice that I've placed an aquarium heater. This is a new aquarium heater into the mixture in order to maintain the optimal temperature between about 75 and 85 degrees. If you have a nice warm room you don't need this but this is a very convenient way of maintaining the temperature. If it runs very cold you run the risk that this could take weeks and potentially wild yeasts or bacteria could grow in here. If you run it too hot obviously you could kill the yeast. That temperature range though is pretty optimal and you'll notice that after about three or four days the bubbling and the churning ceases and that sharp smell of carbon dioxide that comes uh, wafting out through the gap in the lid uh, will disappear. And at that point, you're done. You don't need to go any longer. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get some of the liquid out of here by using a strainer, some cheesecloth, and a, and a um, colander. And then what we're going to do is using a siphon tube, we're going to remove the rest of the liquid, place it into the still in order to do the actual uh, distillation. This is the still. Take this strainer and I'm going to start pulling up this glop.
Now at this point we have pretty much most of the crust gone. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the siphon technique to remove the liquid a little bit more efficiently. And the trick with doing that is going to be a little bit easier if you have somebody on the other end to watch the tubing. So what we're going to do is my cameraman is going to help me and uh, we'll see if we can get this done a little bit more quickly. Okay, now that we've gotten most of the debris out of the container, what we're going to do is siphon the bulk of it out using this tube. And my assistant is going to place the end of the tube below the level of the liquid so that it doesn't break the siphon. I'm going to get a little siphon action going here and then uh, we'll filter out the bulk of the material uh, is going to come uh, through this tube but by uh, Alex watching the end of the tube he can make sure that he doesn't pick up a lot of extra debris. You can get some in the distiller but if you get a lot it can tend to burn during the distillation process. It can make the uh, distiller a little bit more challenging to clean later on. Now we started out with as I said about uh, two gallons of water about five kilograms of bananas and uh, out of that total amount this is a four gallon still we're going to end up filling this up with about half probably about two gallons of liquid and out of that I expect based on the starch content of the bananas the sugar content after the amylase that we should end up getting about two liters of fairly strong spirits at the end and we'll show you how we make that dis that determination and if you have to siphon a lot of times it's not really so bad stuff tastes pretty good Okay, get the rest out of that tube. All right, now let's begin the actual distillation. You can see in here there's about a half full container. Still has a little bit of particulate matter in it, uh, but not a lot, and this shouldn't be a problem in terms of the boiling. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to put this up on the burner, and then we're going to put the top component or the bell. It has some Teflon tape wrapped around it to help to prevent leakage. I'm going to line everything up here. A little silicone tubing to prevent leakage again. It's snugged in here nicely. There's a thermometer on here that's going to give us, give us a measurement of the vapor temperature. And then we also have a uh, condensing device set up to help cool the liquid so that it will condense. Turn a pump on with a radiator. see that it's coming through very nicely. Now initially we're going to turn this up pretty high because we want to get the temperature up just to save time. But once we get the temperature up and we begin to get a little bit of distillate coming out then we're going to turn this down so that we have a more efficient reflux. We don't want to just boil everything out very quickly and have no uh, distribution of temperature in the bell and the, uh, the upper part of the uh, copper kettle. Now there are different types of stills. You can get what are called reflux stills, which have a large vertical column with lots of surface area to promote the separation of the different components. These are typical of the kinds of stills that were made hundreds of years ago and are still used by a number of distilleries just for traditional purposes. They're made out of copper because copper was easier to work with 400 years ago. Stainless steel works very well. Copper works very well. Copper does take a little bit more cleaning when you're done than the stainless steel, but they both produce essentially the same result because you're not trying to put copper into your output. You're not trying to put stainless steel into your output. But the metal uh, container not so relevant. What is relevant is because of the relatively low surface area here, this is called a pot still. And it's going to have a, a lower level of reflux uh, than in a large reflux still. And so the, the separation quality is not going to be as good as it would be with a reflux still. One of the issues though to keep in mind is we're not using distillation here just to remove the grain alcohol. We want to separate components. If all we did was remove the grain alcohol, we would end up with a flavorless and very strong spirit. The water that is in there, it also contains aldehydes and esters and the flavors and the character of what we're trying to distill. So what we're going to do is once this begins to produce some output, 
the most volatile component, which is the methanol. We're going to separate that out when we uh, begin uh, placing the aliquots in the different containers. But then what we're going to do is continually separate the different liquids out. And initially, we're going to be getting very heavy grain alcohol, but then we'll start getting the character coming in in the later stages of the distillation. It's important that we try not to throw anything away because the art of making the actual spirit is going to be the eventual mixing of these different components and that's why we want to be able to separate them as broadly as possible to give us the most flexibility in that final mixing. All we really need to do here is make sure that when we finish the distillation that we have a rough estimate of what is going to be about 5% of that distillation and that is the amount of methanol probably twice as conservative as you need to be to remove the methanol which is the toxic component that comes from the fermentation of the pectin and the cellulose and some of the other uh, fibers that are in the um, in the bananas um, so as a result you can see I have a lot of containers here the idea being that we're going to want to throw away the initial methanol we're not going to want to throw away really anything after that, so then we don't really have to be very careful about making a lot of separations. Where the de decision about what we're going to use and what we're not going to use is going to be made is at the end, and that's where, again, you want to use small containers so that we have that flexibility. Now, this will take a few minutes to heat up, but you can see already that the thermometer on the top is running at about 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and at about 50 degrees centigrade. This will heat up pretty quickly initially, but like I said, once you start to see a few drops forming in the container, we're gonna turn this way down so that we don't overwhelm the condenser and we also get good separation. All right, we're starting to get some output here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna begin collecting that. This should be the methanol. And we have a very small beaker for that. We'll fill up a couple of them. Make sure you label them because you don't want to mess up later on. You're eventually going to take the different uh, cuts, is what they call these aliquots of uh, liquid, and combine them and also throw away the, uh, the initial. Now don't rush this. The slower you go, the more effectively you'll separate this and uh, easier it is to do. I mean, it takes a little bit more time out here, but then you're less likely to be running and trying to get beakers under there at the same time. You're not gonna make this fluid very warm because if this is not able to stay cool enough, you're gonna lose some vapor into the atmosphere. And this still was originally designed to be used, say, outdoors with a garden hose, you know, pouring into the top of this thing. Because I'm using a recirculating type of radiator, it doesn't have the same capability as just adding fresh water. But it's neater, it's more convenient, it forces me to be a little bit slower, but at the same time that's probably the best way to do the distillation anyway. Now you can see the temperature right now is at about 80 degrees centigrade. And the mixture of the water and the alcohol, as it continually concentrates toward a higher percentage of water, will boil at a higher temperature. Eventually when we get to a boiling point of around 100, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees centigrade, most of the alcohol is going to be gone. And that at that point, will probably stop the distillation. Don't worry that you're going to lose anything because whenever we do decide to stop that, whatever is left of the container is still very valid fermentation product. And we can add that to a subsequent uh, distillation without any loss to, add, to continue to get whatever was in the original um, distillation into um, subsequent distillations. In other words, we don't throw it out. We just add it to the next and add it to the next. 
So don't be too concerned about wasting anything if we, um, if we stop a little bit shy. Now when we get enough of the liquid in the main cut here, what I'm going to do is use this hygrometer that we sh I showed you before. And basically we're going to float it inside this graduated cylinder to determine what kind of uh, proof or percentage we have of alcohol. Proof, as you might know, you may know, is essentially two times the percentage. So a 200 proof would be pure grain alcohol. A uh, 100 proof would be 50% grain alcohol. The liquid that comes out of here tends to be pretty strong. And generally speaking, you're going to probably want to cut that with some water just to lower the concentration so that you've got something that's drinkable. That's nice. As you can see, the temperature really hasn't gone up very much in the pot because we had a lot of liquid much alcohol and so the percentage of alcohol in the water is still pretty much the same as when we started. I anticipate that with about five kilograms of uh, bananas that you're going to end up about 40 to 50 percent of that converted into sugars that are fermentable and you get about 85 percent of the weight of the sugar in weight of alcohol. You lose some of the carbons in the carbon dioxide that's why it's not one to one. And so with essentially two liters of anticipated alcohol, uh, we're going to probably end up throwing away about the first 5%, 1 20th, or 100 cc's. And we should end up, like I said, with about two liters of uh, final product. Plus whatever we take out in the form of water uh, that contains the aldehydes and the esters and the flavors. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add what I had in this large beaker to this small, smaller beaker. Allow the process to continue to go on in here. And now I should have enough liquid to test the specific gravity. So we'll go ahead and fill this up and see where it floats. Okay, so that's 80 proof. Okay, so it's still not floating at 138 proof. There we go. So we have about 148 proof in this liquid right here. That's pretty strong. Now a reflux still would probably at this point have something close to about 180 proof. But if we wanted a higher concentration, we could certainly take what we end up with here and throw it back in for a second cycle if we wanted something more concentrated, but I don't. And so there's no need to do that. Man, that smells good. It smells like banana bread cooking but not as strong. Uh, it's a very pleasant uh, aroma. Now in Scotch whiskey and different types of spirits where the intention is to blend them, it's one of the things that made the single malt scotches um, a lot less popular very early on and what really caused the explosion in the popularity of um, blended scotches was that sometimes they're really potent using a pot still with heat infused uh, malted barleys, you end up with a really strong spirit and you had to have a taste for it. But uh, when they began blending the scotches that had less and more character, flavor, strength, smokiness, they were able to essentially blend or produce uh, a more palatable or generally universally attractive uh, spirit. Same idea with you know blending different types of coffee beans. Uh, the art was then in the mixing of the different or the blending of the different um, distillates to produce something that would be more marketable. You could certainly do that with these brandies. You could mix bananas with different types of fruits if you wanted to after the fact. 
uh, that gives you the flexibility of adding things that you want to add to them. But to this, I would generally add nothing. Uh, you can certainly use, use this as it is. You can denature it, you can power your tractor with it. Uh, you can do whatever you like with it, but I would generally start with a purer spirit and then decide what you're going to do with it after that. You'll also notice that the temperature on the still has reached about 100 degrees centigrade, even slightly above that, and that's probably either a little bit of error in the thermometer, but also a little bit of residual sugar uh, that may exist in the, um, the pre-distillate. And so, as a result, that's, that might affect the, uh, the boiling point a little bit. But nevertheless, the specific gravity is the real determinant of what's going to happen here. So we'll get this to about 100 cc's, we'll measure it, and we'll see if we should stop here or if we should maybe go a little bit further. All right, so now what I'm going to do is, this is number 7, and we'll get a specific gravity measurement on that. That's sort of the middle cut. And if you look carefully, right now, we've come down a little bit. We're at about 145 proof there or so. And then what we're going to do is take a look at something a little further on. substantially lower. So now we're at, you see that that's 40, 50, 60, 70, and it's bouncing around about 70 or so proof. So 11 is going to be a little bit lower than that, 12 is going to be lower yet, and 13 is probably going to be around 40 proof or so. So when we fill this up, we'll consider that the distillation of this batch is complete. And then we'll do a total. We've got about 500, 500, that's 1,200, 1,280, 1,360, 1,420, 1,500, about 1,650, plus the 160 I've got back here. So we've got about 700, 1720. So the 1% 1 of that is basically 17 cc's. So we're gonna throw away the first 85 cc's of that, of this material. So number one, which is 40, and number two, which is another 40, these go in the trash. We don't want these, these are the methanol. The rest of this is potable. As I said, the real art is going to be blending these, these later cuts that have a lot more aroma, much stronger flavor, but much less alcohol into the stronger, uh, higher concentration alcohol spirit. Now you can do this alone, but I would advise doing this with at least one or two other people to help you. And if you get a lot of people to help you, you may not have very much left over to blend. But that's not a problem, you just, next time you use more bananas. Uh, this process, obviously, takes a little bit of time, but it's very pleasant, and it does show that distillation isn't just a laboratory exercise. It can be something that you can use for practical purposes. So, hopefully this was uh, useful, kind of interesting, a little bit different than what we've done before, and uh, like I usually say, this was a lot of fun. So thanks a lot for watching, and uh, please subscribe because, like I said before, it really helps us out. You have a wonderful afternoon.